Okay, um, I think what, 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 we, what I want to cover, what we want to cover in this section is just our progression as Milano and Company uh, through using the sensor technology, uh, where we came from and how we got here, and then how, how we've gone about trying to use this information to better uh, understand our irrigation demand, our ir irrigation needs. Um, the, the, the thing about this is, um, you know, what John presented earlier today uh, was very good. Um, there's a lot of information there. I think a lot of you recognize that that's, uh, a lot of it was nursery and ornamental work, uh, not really directly uh, mentally connectable to uh, what a lot of you do with avocados. I know there's a lot of avocado growers here. There's some nursery, there's some. So the nursery guys, I think, can see the, the relationship. The important thing, I think, is that what John presented this morning really reflected a great diversity of crops, a great diversity of cropping systems that, that are able to be used and translated into a lot of the crops that are commonly grown in San Diego County. Um, the, the, the thing is it's a work in progress. The technology is there. The t deployability of this technology, I am absolutely confident, is simple and easy to do and just about everybody can do it. Um, and, and can do it economically. Um, what's not there is the crop information. Okay, we know that in the case of avocados, through you know the, the abundance of work that the Avocado Commission has done, uh, you know, using CIMIS data or weather station data or what have you, there's been a lot of work used to fine tune irrigation because it is a, it is a big component. How to use these sensors to improve on that has not been determined. Okay, and that's where it comes down to grower experience and grower understanding, um, looking at the data, looking at the system, looking at what they currently are doing in their operations, and, and taking that and translating that into an improvement. Okay, we unfortunately don't have at this point in time the university data on avocados that tells us how to use this. Okay, but I felt it was important to bring this forward at this time, even without that, given the crisis that we have, the circumstances of, of, of the water drought and everything else, th there's going to be a component of growers that are going to recognize this, deploy it, and, and benefit from, from what, what this tool is. Okay? Um, as Milano and Company, uh, we have actually been using sensor technology, uh, uh, or playing with it, I should say, for probably uh, 15 years or more. Uh, we first came across this technology uh, in the mid to late 90s. There was a gentleman that lived in Fallbrook uh, that was a retired NASA engineer that somehow, some way, uh, got into using this concept of, of these, this, this principle, the physics behind this, to, uh, to monitor irrigation. And so we did a fair amount of work with him for about a year or two years. Um, ultimately, it disappeared. Uh, he was underfunded. Uh, he moved away. Uh, who knows what it was? Um, it 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 was in the early stages and wasn't really close to being able to be used. There was a long period of time where we didn't do anything with it, and then uh, about seven or eight years ago, uh, a system by put out by a company, Acclima. I think you mentioned Acclima. Uh, surfaced. Uh, I, I can't remember how I found it, where we found it, where we saw it, but it was very usable. So we deployed Acclima. Um, on our farms, primarily in Carlsbad at the flower fields. Uh, it's, it's a nice system. It has a very nice controller. Uh, the challenge with Acclima for us was it's a wired system, so you have to have wires running to the sensors and running to the fields, uh, which makes it very problematic. Um, and it was fickle. Uh, for some reason, some sensors worked, some sensors didn't. Um, but even as it was in Carlsbad at the flower fields, the Acclima system allowed us to save about 15 to 20 percent of the water that we historically had been putting on. So it was a very, very solid system. Um, we used that same system at our farm in, in, in Oceanside, in San Luis Rey, uh, and it told us a lot about what we didn't know. Um, we thought we had it figured out. We put this uh, sensor system in one of our main crops, Myrtle. It's a perennial foliage crop. Um, and it turned out that was a rainy fall. And it was very, very eye-opening because our normal pattern was when a rain event occurred, we took that as one irrigation set. And so we would tell our irrigator guys, you know, if we're on an every three-day pattern or once a week pattern, just lay off one irrigation and come back, uh, you know, under your normal pattern and, and go for it. Well, the sensor, uh, once we reviewed it after the rain event, the, the moisture level hadn't dropped. 
And so we said, well, you know, the moisture level under a, a normal set, we would have watered today. Okay, wait. We're going to wait until we see this thing move. Well, it didn't for quite a number of days. And by the time it started to move, another rain event hit. And what ended up happening is where we would have had probably about four to six irrigation sets in that November to January window, we ended up having zero because the sensor told us there was more than enough water. Our irrigator didn't need to irrigate. We told them, lay off. And the crop was not affected at all. It was beautiful. Everything was perfect. So it taught us a very valuable lesson uh, relative to that. Problem was, Acloma is very difficult to deploy, in my opinion, on a large scale. You know, on our farm in San Luis Reyes, 300 acres. We have 50 different crops. We have 200 different blocks. Uh, to run that mountain of wire out there, uh, not, you know, not to mention the cost, but just to actually get it done is a monumental task. Um, so we were using it in other ways. Uh, I met John a, a few years ago and then saw his presentation in, in, uh, at a conference here this past summer, or in, and it was really, I think, a, an eye-opening event for me. Finally, there was technology that had come through a USDA grant that was developed in con conjunction with University of Maryland and Georgia and these other researchers with Carnegie Mellon, which is a very high level uh, institute for developing mechanical implementation software and things of that nature, that created a system that, that was deployable on, on a very large scale, uh, very quickly, very simply, and very cost effectively. So we embraced it, we drank the Kool-Aid or whatever you want to call it, and um, I got together with John and said, let's, let's, let's do this. Now, as the water crisis uh, continued to unfold, um, t for me, it, it became um, too obvious that even though this is at the early stages, we don't have the information for avocados, we needed to get this in the growers' hands down here um, to help in any way it possibly can with, with the cutbacks anybody is going to be faced with. So, just to, this is one of the first crops that we started to use the sensor system in. This is Solidago. Um, it's it's a it's an ornamental uh, floriculture version of goldenrod for some of you that don't know Solidago. We grow it in plastic houses uh, uh, undercover, and um, so we went about putting this the sensor system in place. Uh, the first thing is we needed we wanted to determine what is the depth that we need to place the sensor. Okay, when you dig the hole, you have to dig a hole in a perennial crop or an annual crop. This is not in pots. Uh, you dig a you know four six inch hole, you review the the root profile, and you pick the spot where there's the largest mass of roots because you're assuming that's where the largest consumption of water is going to be coming from, and that's what we did. So we did that with Solidago. We came down that said okay the bulk of the roots are eight inches, then we bracketed it. We said okay let's put a, a sensor at four inches and let's put a sensor at twelve inches and let's see what we what we have that's going on. Um, uh, sure enough, the eight inch probe did prove out to be the probe with uh, the bulk of the water absorption. Uh, I'll, I'll show you a cleaner picture of that in a few minutes. So that was step number one. Okay. Step number two, uh, which is where we didn't know how to use this, right? So we just told our irrigator, just keep doing what you're doing. Okay. Don't change anything. Don't modify anything. Just keep doing what you're doing. Our normal pattern in this window was an every other day irrigation set for two hours. Okay, that's, that's typical. That's what we, in our experience, determined that Solidago needed, and that's what our watering guy was doing. Okay, so when you look at this graph, and I, I, you know, unfortunately, there's a lot of busy work here, but I think it's important. The key thing here is this is the window where we first deployed it. Okay, that is the moisture level. The, these green, black, and blue lines are the different sensors at different levels. And so just look at a generality. Our soil moisture was up here. Okay, that's 25% soil moisture. And it didn't vary. It really didn't get to a point where there was any water being consumed. So in actuality, we were just putting water on top of water on top of water because we were afraid to affect the crop. We told them, okay, after that, we said, we're going to make a couple of decisions here. First, we're not going to turn on that, that sensor until it gets to 20%. So we dropped ourselves down to this 20% this range. And we did another thing. We said, let's 
let's change the water uh, set from two hours to one hour. And so from, from this point forward, that's what we did. Okay, so we went from an every other day, two hour irrigation set to a one hour irrigation set only when the crop told us it needed it. And you see a much different picture from here on down. You see, you know, not this bing, 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 water, water, water. You see water, no, no, yes, yes, no, yes, no, yes, because the, we were allowing the, the device to tell us what to do, okay? So from this point forward, we feel we saved uh, probably 50% of the water that we historically would have put on that crop. Yeah? That green bar across there, does that say target zone? You know, that, that's a target zone that we set. That's a work in progress, okay? You don't know where it is, really. We, we don't know where it is. We do know, or we do believe now, that, you know, 20% um, is, is pretty fair because this crop was not affected as far as quality was concerned, from, from our judgment. It was not affected as far as yield was concerned. We still got the same number of stems per acre that we did under normal expected circumstances. The things that you have to watch for now, the, the thing that, that, that is, when you cut the water back, I think John mentioned it, you know, you're, you're consolidating more salt. So you have to be really monitoring your ECs much tighter, okay? There is an EC probe uh, in association with this system. Um, we're still learning how to use that. We don't rely on it. We still rely on laboratory analysis. And during the course of this trial, we sent more frequent samples in to the lab just to monitor EC that way as well as doing a manual EC analysis. Because you can, you're, you're really, you're not, you're not leaching all the time. Where before, in here, we're basically leaching all the time, right? Every watering is a leaching watering. This here, we're bringing it. And so we learned that we had to periodically then go away from the one hour irrigation set and go to a couple hours or a couple subsequent days, one day after the other, to leach out our salts. Yeah. That's always one of, one of my questions because you know, occasionally you run into growers that are watering avocados um, with uh, very uh, small amounts of water mm -hmm. frequently. And mm -hmm. of course, the other side is that you do it less frequently for longer periods of time. So every watering becomes a leaching mm -hmm. of some sort. My question, I guess, would be with an avocado that's really sensitive to chloride, if you constantly have a certain level of chloride in that root zone, uh, and let's say you're leaching every third or fourth time, according to maybe a, you know, an EC reading mm -hmm. or something, is that perennial crop going to continually be taking up excess amounts of, of chloride in lieu of having a leaching irrigation? Well, right. I, you know, each crop is that leaching fraction is going to need to be determined, right? You're going to need to figure out how sensitive your crop is, what windows can it tolerate salt or not tolerate salt, and and you're going to need to make sure you have your your fraction adjusted appropriately. And that's why I'm saying, you know, a lot of this stuff is is really we got to take the principles of what we're talking about here and translate them into the crops as best we can. And and so. Um, it is, it is a work in progress and it's something that everybody needs to be aware of as you change uh, the paradigm, as you change your methodologies to do this. Now, what you're trying to do, um, this is uh, real time, okay, we're, we're 522, so this is today. Uh, the, you can set these things to take data uh, in whatever time frames you want. The more frequently you take data, the shorter the life of the battery. So if you take data, every, you know, send data to the data center every hour, it's going to consume a lot of battery time. If you do it three or four times a day, it's much less. So it all comes down to your personal palate of how frequent you want to be able to review this, this data. Okay? So what we're trying to do then is uh, fine tune our irrigation events because what we want to do is we want to put enough water, if we have a sensor at four, eight and 12, and we know that the 12 is outside the root zone. If, if we put an irrigation set that that 12 inch sensor recognizes, then we've put up to four inches more water on than what we really needed to because the roots are only consuming it in that four to eight inch window. So uh, you wanna make sure that your irrigation set is tightened so that you know one hour, two hours, hour and a half, five hours is what you need to saturate the root zone without getting to the sensor that's below the root zone. 
unless you're doing a leaching set, and then your leaching fraction, maybe you want a sensor below the root zone that you recognize, okay, I'm gonna do a leaching set, I wanna make sure I put enough water to, to, to push through the root zone. I know I've done that when my 12 inch uh, 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 sensor recognizes water and spikes above, uh, above the zone. So when you look at this particular graph, the four inch is the green line, the eight inch is the black line, and the 12 inch is the, um, I'm sorry, four, eight, and 12, okay? So we have a lot of water consumption out of the four, we have a lot of water consumption out of the eight, and we have very little water consumption out of the 12, okay? So that confirmed where our roots and where the absorption was coming from, okay? You pretty typically see this kind of step down of, of consumption because that come, it recognizes night and day. So here's a nighttime fraction, daytime, heavy consumption, nighttime, daytime, nighttime. It goes through that little roller coaster all the way down. You can use that trend also to predict when you're going to need to water, right? So in the case of the Solidago, we said we're going to water when we get to 20, and we're going to water an hour. You can tell that we're following this slope. Okay, you know, we're going to need to probably be setting a watering event on Wednesday. Okay, it looks like we're going to get to Wednesday unless the weather really changes, amps up or amps down, and, and that's the way we go. Um, This is one of our, our main crops. This is a crop called myrtle, uh, same kind of effect. You can see uh, 522, here's where it rained, okay? This is the, the rain, the rains that we had last week and the effects of those rains. Now we're, we're, we're learning, we didn't put as much work into the myrtle up to this point as we did is into the Solidago. Uh, myrtle's an outdoor crop. Uh, you, know, you didn't see the effect of the rains on the Solidago, but you do you do on the myrtle, okay? Yeah. You said your, so your end trigger point, you're not using a sensor for that? You're still watering a set base to time? Like you always put an hour on? Or do yeah. you water until you reach a certain sensor? In, in, in the case of, of, yeah, we're just watering for a set amount of time at this, at this moment. We haven't taken it to where we're, we're, we're changing that, but so far we've been able to reduce it to an hour uh, now, in the case of the myrtle, you can see where we had um, our probes are 6, 12, and 18. So 6, 12, and 18. So we're not getting very much water um, absorption at 18. We're getting a lot at 6 and 12. Okay. But yet our irrigation sets are so long that our, our, our probe, our sensor at 18 inches is really spiking, right? So that, this is telling us that we probably can cut back the water uh, set on our, on our myrtle crop by probably 30%, okay? And, and then, then that 18 inch sensor maybe doesn't see any, any moisture, okay? Yeah? A couple of questions. I assume you got a number of sensors out there to kind of average, obviously you don't have one sensor for the entire thing or you just depend on it being that representative? Uh, Another question. Uh, You know, we, we have done some with the tensiometers and, and the watermarks, and I think one of the gentlemen earlier when we first started commented, it's our experience, they're always not primed when you go to read the data, and so then you've got to reprime them. They're very laborious. You've got to get a, somebody to go around on a regular basis and make sure they take the data, and then they've got to bring the data in, and you've got to sit there and look at it and analyze it. This takes all of that out. Yeah, I think Watermark has a little bit more along those lines. I, I haven't really looked at it that closely. This, this stuff is just so more, much further technologically advanced than any of that that my money's on this. You know, I drank the Kool-Aid, okay? <laughs> yeah. But how about the sensitivity of tensiometer versus? Oh, I, I, you know, John would be a good person to, to ask the specificity of that accuracy, but this is very accurate. This, this is very, very accurate uh, information that we're getting. Testing a different thing. It's testing the water versus the tension. Yeah, it's, 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 it's testing available moisture, okay? Volumetric water. Yeah, if you look at your plant, you can yeah. tell where you're going, right? 
Yeah. So, so, um, but you know, clearly it, it tells us a tremendous amount of information that we didn't have before. Um, very quickly, real time, uh, today, not yet. Yeah. Have you had the chance to check the uh, trigger points that you might be getting irrigation uh, with different water uh, qualities? Uh, because I know Carlsbad has recycled water mm -hmm. as compared to potable, or are you using just potable water? We use both in Carlsbad. Um, and, and really what we do is we just monitor mostly EC in both instances, but we monitor much closer when we're using Reclaim because the Reclaim water has a much higher uh, salinity level. So we'll, we, we, we tend to increase the leaching fraction when we're doing uh, reclaimed water over, over potable water. So, you had a question? No, okay. Uh, on your leaching fraction, are you leaching every irrigation or are you trying to just do it once mm -hmm. a no, we try and we, we, we don't do it every irrigation. That's what we're trying to get away from. Um, we're, we're, it's not our intent, even under normal circumstances, to do leaching irrigation on, on every instance. Now, there are some crops that we have that are much more sensitive to salts, and so we are much more careful and much more conservative in those crops than others. Uh, but we, we tend to monitor the fields on, on pretty much a monthly or bimonthly <laughs> basis and leach as the laboratory analysis tells us that we're, we're getting out of range. Yeah. Your salinity sensors that the, they sell, are they, do you have any experience on being able to use those and uh, use less lab or um, don't trust them? Well, here, here is, um, this, this is really frequent. I, we knew we were going to be doing this meeting. We have uh, an 80 acre avocado grove that we have on our farm. Okay, so I set up one of the sensor units uh, on that grove on the 6th. Okay, so we put it in on the sinks, and this is the data that we're seeing in that in that avocado uh, planting. Now we have we have them set at uh, I got for some reason two of these set at six. Oh, okay. Okay. So in the avocados, twelve inch, six inch, and four inch. Let me clear out the, the, the um, EC. Okay. So that's what we're, we're looking at right now. Um, four inches is the orange, six inch is the black line, and 12 inch is the blue line. Okay. And so, you know, we don't, again, 12 inches, we're not seeing water uh, consumption, water absorption for the most part. It's staying pretty static, it's not real high. But we're not also irrigating a lot to get a lot of moisture down below the root zone there. So it's, it's a little bit on the dry side, but it's not, uh, we're not seeing any consumption. We're seeing consumption, uh, you can see the six inch line and the four inch line have, have quite a bit. Okay. Um, what kind of sprinklers? Or micros or? Uh, uh, micro, uh, pressure compensated micros. I mean, Keith's seen them more frequently than, than I have actually. <laughs> So, so that's the moisture. Now, the EC, so here's, here's the EC sensor, okay? And we're just starting to, to use the EC sensor. Well, it comes out with a, with, with a reading that needs to be calibrated. And so these numbers aren't reflective of, of what the EC levels really are. Um, I, I don't understand the physics behind it or the physiology behind how these sensors work. Uh, John recognized that, but there's some conversion factors that need to go into place. We need to take salinity, uh, take EC measurements and get what the actuals are and then come up with some conversion factors to bring these into line with what they really are. It's also my understanding that with these uh, sensors, um, the EC measurement is not really accurate if the soil is dry. So your most accurate measurement is just is after irrigation set when, when the root zone is still fairly moist, you'll get the most accurate reading and then after that it kind of drops off. So you end up with a little bit of this roller coaster based on the amount of moisture that's available in the root zone. Uh, John's feeling is that the EC is, is a very accurate reading and something that we can use to help uh, determine when we need a leaching fraction. And wouldn't it be nice if we could just sit at our computers in our offices and say, oh look, you know, I need to do a leaching on that field versus waiting, you know, doing what, historically, what, uh, August and September, we need to really increase the leaching, or, oh crap, look, the leaves are uh, uh, showing uh, salinity damage, I better leach. This is gonna tell you um, 
hopefully when that, when that opportunity uh, needs to be um, taken on, okay? So it, it, this is a kind of, kind of to, to um, where's, where's our, yeah, ooh, what's going on there? Decagon, um, you know, th this is all came about because of the USDA grant and, and the work that's gone on. Decagon makes a great sensor. It's the best sensor that I've seen. Uh, the technology being wireless, and this is not meant as a, you know, the Decagon's the, the best in the world. Uh, but they have really good wireless technology. The deployment of this is really good. I really, no knock against Decagon, but I don't like their software. Okay, the software that they have to run this, um, I find to be limiting and, and, and a bit challenging. The company, uh, this company Mayim, M-A-Y-I-M, SensorWeb, is the company that took the work that Carnegie Mellon did in conjunction with this USDA grant and, and has been advancing it and bringing it to, to the marketplace. Um, I like it a lot better. It, it, it's, it's a lot more flexible. Um, it, it's got a lot more opportunity to be able to help farmers, I think, going forward. And John is very, very familiar with how to use SensorWeb, so he's been a very good resource in, in helping us to learn how to do this. Now, again, it's also a work in progress, right? They're getting a lot of grower input. What do you need? What do you want to see? How do, how do we make this function? Um, you know, one of the things that I threw out at them is that they need to come up with a... Uh, this will ultimately allow you to open and close valves in the fields automatically based on the data. Okay, once you determine length of irrigation set, you determine your soil moisture that you want to get to to trigger an event, um, with what they have coming out, this will turn your valves on and off for you uh, in, in, in whatever time frame you want. It will also send out alerts um, that they will say, you know what, it's time to water that field because you've hit uh, your moisture. So um, there, there's, there's quite a bit of stuff that they have that they've developed. The one thing that I pointed out to them is that the water volume that we have available at any moment in time is not infinite, right? So if we have, you know, all of a sudden, 20 acres it comes on and says we need water, and you only have eight water for five or three. Uh, they need some algorithm in there that says there's X amount of water available. Which field is going to get the water, and, and when is it when is it going to um, uh, be dispersed? In our operation, um, we don't have the luxury right now of going to automation. Most of our crops are, are row crops. They're, they're watered with drip irrigation systems. Um, the avocados is something completely separate, obviously, but um, we have to manually water at this point in time um, because there's between coyotes and, 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 and gophers and squirrels and toads and, and you know guys with cutters uh, picking the flowers, there's always a break. And so if we don't have a guy physically open and close valves, um, we just end up with a lot of lost water. So we, we manually do that at this point in time. But I do believe there's going to be a day where we're going to be using something like this uh, th where the individual will know what field's supposed to be watered. He'll go to that field, uh, hit his iPhone to turn on the watering set, check to make sure everything's intact, and that watering set will progress through its normal routine. Now, one of the things that we do know right now is, you know, you ask the, how many, you ask your watering guys, uh, unless it's yourself, did you water for two hours? Oh, yeah, I watered for two hours. Well, then you, know, you see him over there sitting in the back 40 having his lunch, and you knew that, that water was supposed to be off 20 minutes ago or half an hour ago, right? There's, there's physically no way in a complex operation for a guy to get around and turn that damn valve off at two hours exactly, right? And every 10 or 20 minutes is 5 or 10%. Well, you know, it adds up real quick, really, really quick. Or... You know, they're on the other side of the farm, and the one over there needs to be turned off, and it takes them forever to, to drive through all the roads and get to that particular because he's not in the right spot at the right time. So I just view this as another opportunity for us to really fine-tune our, our savings because I know the guys aren't sticking to that two-hour set or that one-hour set or that three-hour set. They can't. It, it's not possible. So there's another gap of savings. They're going to err, like John said, we're conservative. They're going to err on the side of giving it too much water rather than giving it not enough water. They don't want to hear from us, you know, you turned it into toast. You know, it's, it's, it's not going to happen. So very flexible. It's going to have a lot more advances. It is, again, another work in progress, but I'm very confident it's going to be a, a really important tool going forward. Yeah. How does the Mayhem software connect to the Decagon? 
Okay, so the, the, the way that the sensors work, um, you have the 3G sensor that operates off a normal cell phone platform and there's an annual subscription for that. I, I can't remember what it is, 50 or 75 or $80 dollars or somewhere in that a year for that component. Uh, it sends the information you know, through 3G to Decagon servers and Decagon is collecting the data on their servers and then we access the information to Decagon via their servers. The MAM will pull the data just like we can pull the data from Decagon, MAM can pull the data from Decagon and, and, and use it and manages it on their servers. Okay, so, so you can access both? Yeah, I can access both of them. Yeah, I can access both of them. Um, and, that's how, and that's how it works. Where are the two companies located? Where do they operate out of? Uh, Decagon is in Pullman, Washington. And Mayhem, I think, is back east somewhere. I'm not, I'm not, uh, maybe Maryland near, you know, I think it very closely uh, aligned with Carnegie Mellon in, in that uh, university camp. So Silicon Valley isn't involved? I don't yeah. think so. I don't, uh, yeah, I don't, no. I, I don't think so. Now, the, the Wi-Fi based system, it, that's just kind of rolling out now. That's not yet available. It's, it's coming to market. Uh, we expect to see ourselves, we're working very closely with Decagon to, to help them figure this stuff out. And so we expect to see the beta test uh, module here in the next two or three weeks. Uh, but I don't think it's going to be available for the marketplace for probably 30 to 45 days. Uh, that's a different platform. John, John mentioned that. That's a line of sight, Wi-Fi based uh, technology. Uh, it's not going to have the, I don't believe it's going to have an annual subscription fee. Um, I think it's, you know, once you buy the unit, you have the unit. Um, you know, it, I think that's going to be the way for us to go. Uh, we are right now deploying a Wi-Fi network across our entire 300 acres and it's pretty cost effective to do that with the technology that's out there today. Um, there, you know, just a Wi-Fi tower and, and a couple of key located stations and we think we're going to be able to cover the farm. We're doing that not just because of Decagon, uh, there's just a whole fleet of wireless technologies that's coming into to the marketplace for agricultural operations to utilize to help minimize the, 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 the labor, the manual component the, of all this data collection. Um, one thing that we're beta testing right now is a device that sits on top of one of our wells. Okay, it's a little, looks like a little mushroom, it screws into the top of the sounding tube, it has a tail on it about that long, and um, it tells me what our water level in our well is 24-7. Takes a reading, sends it to, via Wi-Fi, I can sit at my desk where before it's like, you know, are, are we, you know, how close are we getting to the pumps? Are we over pumping, under pumping? Uh, you know, of course, the unknown worry was there. Um, and, and, and so then I wouldn't know until we send a guy out to do the sounding. Um, and now it's almost a bit annoying because I know 24 seven, I sit there at my desk and go, where are we at? Oh, where are we at? And so you know, every 15 <laughs> minutes, I can see where, where our well level is if I, wanna, if I wanna look at it. And there's just a whole bunch of technology that's evolving and coming to the marketplace for agriculture that's based on Wi-Fi technology. So that's the reason why we're, we're going to put in these Wi-Fi towers strategically located on our farm so that we can, we can cover uh, one end to the other. And we think, we think that uh, we're going to be able to cover probably 95% of our fields. And there's, there's a few that are probably in really remote, low locations um, that line of sight is going to be pretty challenging to, to get to. Uh, but I think, or at least get to uh, with the economics that we're putting out there. I, I think we can get to there if we really want to spend the money, uh, uh, to, and it, it proves to be that important. Are you doing your Wi-Fi trial for you kind of as a personal thing, or are you trying to look at it from a kind of a San Diego County thing? Wi-Fi is a radio pig. I wouldn't, I would actually recommend against. I'd go 802.15, but well, I, so is, is it, are you kind of doing it as a collective effort to say, hey, San Diego? This, this, is, just, or is, it just this is just internal based on, and I don't know that world, okay? okay. So I got to rely on the IT guys that, that play with that. Um, and so our, our IT guy, guy, we have a guy that works on our place uh, one to two days a week, and he takes care of all of our networking and all of our, our issues. And so he's got, he's got the handle on that. And it's, it's strictly uh, taking our our uh, connectivity and, and dispersing it across the farm. So I. But are you trying to go to an autonomous node, like uh, solar battery, remote powered, or like, we're trying to, because for, so, 
I'm trying to figure out how to get this cost effective for people who have like a 10 acre house. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. It's pretty hard to say, hey, I need to plop in this $30,000 right. system. Yeah. Right? But we have a lot of technologies that's available to yeah. us to do this. And yeah. like, I mean, I've done it on my grove. It's mesh network. Yeah. I run 802.15 radios. They yeah. run all day long. Yeah. Read soil moisture sensors, turn my valves on and off yeah. and things like that. But like, it'd be nice to tie into a lot of these software mechanisms. Mm -hmm. so that's why I was asking kind of the open API question yeah. earlier. Yeah. So I almost get to a sense where we, at least in San Diego, in a sense we're unique. I think we've all been pretty efficient in water usage mm -hmm. for a while. And there's a lot of people kind of starting to come into yeah. this realm. And so when we evaluate these, I don't know if anybody's <laughs> looking at it from that. Yeah. Well, I don't think what we're deploying as far as Wi-Fi is that expensive. Okay, at least it's budget-wise, he's not come to me and say it's $30,000. It's, it's really reasonable. We're doing AC because most of we have power in, in several of the locations. If needed, we're going to go with a small solar um, unit to, to keep in and in, in function that way. Uh, I'd be glad to put you in contact with, with our IT guy if you want to talk with him about what he's doing and provide more clarity on, on what he's discovered and what he's he's come up with. But okay. yeah, it's it's not it's not uneconomical. You know, the thing that we saw when John presented the numbers earlier about water savings, return on investment, and the, the operations that he, he used as examples, they're very complex, okay? And so uh, I, I really believe that, you know, that's an extreme example. Most of us in this room are not dealing with, you know, a, a large installation. We're dealing with, you know, two, five, ten acre uh, monocrop or bicrop uh, situations. So you're not going to need 50 nodes and, and, and 100 sensors. You're going to need maybe one or two sensors and one node per, per crop, uh, possibly. Uh, and so that's going to prove to be a very economical uh, thing to deploy, especially with the cost of water. Now, how much are you going to save? You know, it all depends on the individuals and, and how they go about doing the irrigating. And, and some are going to save a lot. Some are going to save a little. I, I'm, I'm very confident that everybody will save some. More importantly, I think there's going to be gains as people learn how to use this, this information, there's going to be gains in improving yields and in improving the quality of the finished crop because your timing of irrigation is going to be more appropriate, your fertility levels are going to be more appropriate. You know, we all know that we're going to be faced with uh, nitrate, groundwater monitoring, uh, all these other things that go along with that. Well, these tools are going to allow you to automate those processes, okay? They're really going to allow you to, to to get away from the manual record keeping and tracking and, and turn it into an automated a regulatory person is going to come in, hey, I need to check your records, okay, here you go, click, what do you want to see? You know, it's going to be right there because the machine took it all in for you. Uh, the, you know, the, the fleet and the suite of other um, pieces that John showed you are, are, are important. They're not really part of this discussion, but, you know, very easy to set up a weather station if you want. You know, temperature, humidity, wind speed. Uh, all, all a huge variety of other uh, pieces of the puzzle, especially if you're doing pesticide applications or other, other activities. A lot of the, the uh, you know, information that you would need to have to report to the Department of Ag Weights and Measures or other parties is going to be automatically located. You want to know what it was on, on Friday the 13th? Okay, well, here's what the wind speed was on Friday the 13th at 8 o'clock in the morning. And um, you don't need to have that manual piece of paper sitting in a filing cabinet that then you got to go find it and dig it out and, and do all those kinds of things. So there's just a whole bunch of stuff, I think, that as an ancillary connect to, connection to, to this, this, the technology is advancing beyond just water monitoring, but we're talking about water irrigation monitoring today. Yeah. So remind me, if you want, I'll, yeah, I'll get you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I was thinking of which, what are, is there technology coming in to, to sense nutrients in the soil? Or is that already there? Yeah. Uh, in, obviously, it's not a big issue like water. Yeah, I'm. I'm not. I'm not real well versed on that. I know that there. There are some. Um, there are some um, tools that 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 are laboratory grade, but developed for the field to monitor fertility level. Uh, the, the the the. We haven't found them to be practical yet because they require real clean water source and, and it, it's, it's kind of a complex area to get in. But there are cost effective probes out there that will measure NPK. Uh, so. After this meeting's over, who are the resources? You know, when we really want to get into it and 
develop it other than the company and obviously you're a private individual and you're not going to be out there advising them. Yeah, I, I think, you know, uh, I think at least initially, John is, is open to being um, the point person, okay? And then, and then um, he's working very closely with Decagon to help them figure out what's the best way to get this. And, and it really is one of those issues where um, it's not just being able to sell the unit, right? There's the whole support factor. How, how, do, how do you use sensor web? Where do I go to figure that out? Uh, the customer support point of it. Um, you know, all too often we've been involved with these systems, and actually, and honestly, we were involved with Decagon probably about 10 years ago when we chose Acoma. Okay, and at that time, it, it was it was that component, that service component, was that was the challenge. Okay, it was how do you how do you use this? You know, how do we? And and so now that that understanding has evolved quite a bit. I believe, and he can talk about it when he comes back in. But I think John is prepared, at least for now with this rollout and, and the information that we've provided to everybody to at least be the initial initial point of contact. Um, one of the things, because we're kind of on the front edge of this, um, you know, I, I, maybe I mentioned it, but you know, to me there, there, there's, it's an evolving information base. It's not really perfect and ready to go yet, but given the crisis that we're in, it was too important to not have this technology be demonstrated to people that wanted to embrace it. Uh, what, what we're gonna do, um, this year is I have an intern that's going to come on, um, Sean. Okay, and Sean's, Sean is a student from Cal Poly Pomona, where my wife is the department chair. So I have like these insider trading kind of things going on. But anyway, so Sean's going to be on board with us, and Sean is going to be focused on our deployment of this technology uh, to to a broader uh, level of our, our fields. He's also going to be working with Mission RCD to fine tune all of our irrigation systems to make sure we're as uniform as possible. But the other part of it is uh, we're going to we're going to have Sean help John if there are farmers here that are going to need some help in deploying this technology. Uh, we're going to get Sean trained up to help people get installations and show them how to get that uh, get that going. And then if if it proves to be a bigger job than then that, then we'll figure out a way um, to 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 make it happen. I think John's committed to working with the farmers. He's very uh, very excited about what what is going on in San Diego County and and California in general. But from the knowledge point of view, you know, he's a he's a brainiac. He's a he's a professor that likes all this kind of developmental work, and so he's really really interested to see what the grower experience is, how this technology really works and how it can be refined to an even more effective and useful tool going forward. Okay, so we, we can ask him that question afterwards, but I think John is, is gonna be the, the contact, at least for now, and then he'll either figure out how to delegate that to Decagon to get them to, to fulfill the requests, or, or we're gonna help out, or we'll, we'll sort that all out, okay? Any other? Yeah. Um, a pretty simple question, but <clears throat> Avocado growth on the hillside. Mm -hmm. Would you uh, put sensors in three different locations, top, middle, and bottom, or how, how would you kind of set that up? Um, yeah, I, I probably, I probably would. You know, I, you I change your zones also yeah. because you might have to water more at the top yeah. than the bottom. So you yeah, some I, I probably, I probably would do that. Um, and and you know, I, I tend to go on the over, on the overload side of curiosity. You know, so if you're curious about it, then you probably want to want to put a sensor in and, and, and see how it looks. Um, but it all comes down to figuring out what you're comfortable with for the block that you're dealing with that's going to be the representative sample, right? And so, you know, maybe, maybe you deploy top, bottom, and middle, and, and you look at it, and you say, oh, you know what? It, it, you look at it for a month, or you look at it for a period of time you're coming, and there's no significant difference. So that tells you maybe under a good, well-managed, well-balanced system, you don't need top, bottom, and middle, and you're and you're comfortable with taking, you know, something in the heart as being the representative, you know, sample. Pretty surely you don't want to use anything on the edge, right? The easiest thing most people, well, I'll, the valve's here. I want to plug it here, and I'll put it in this tree right next to the road. Well, that that's not going to be representative, right? We all know that. So you're going to want to go into the into the grove or into the planting somewhere in the center, and um, or somewhere where you feel is representative. And, and now in the case of ornamentals, it's easy for us in many instances to, to monitor the crop. 
we'll put a sensor and, and we, we can do our business of, of irrigation relative to what that sensor is telling us. And if all of a sudden we see, well, over here it's, it's wilting or it's not growing as, as robustly, well, then that tells us that either we need to adjust our, our thought process to accommodate for that irregularity in the field, or we need to put the sensor maybe over there because that's a more, you know, we, we don't want the field to suffer. We want the worst place to be, uh, be the one that's, that's driving the bus, unless it's diseased or there's other, there's other issues that are coming along with that. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you had the sensors at three different levels. If we're going back to, on the hillside, would you put them at the three different levels in, in the ground, or would you just pick one? Uh, I would probably, um, I, I would probably pick one, one depending on my appetite for, for expense and the cost that you see and you know maybe the, the cost of, to you is worth it to have three sensors at, at three different depths at four different places up and down the, 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 the planting. I would probably pick one representative spot to look at the, the, the root zone and put three in that one and then maybe I'd put one at, at the other ones that I was pretty sure was the root zone that I wanted to, 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 to monitor, but um, you know, that, that is the process. You, know, you got the process of wh what depth do I put the sensor, and generally speaking, we're bracketing at, you know, as a first step, what's the, what's the sensor depth that I want to use to monitor for my irrigations, and you, you really need to fine tune that based on what you're seeing. Once you've picked that, then you know, how many places do I need that across the, the grove or the planting, and uh, do I want to put one sensor below the root zone to monitor for leaching fraction? Okay, do I really want to do that? Now, um, these probes also monitor temperature. Now, for a lot of people, temperature maybe isn't that important, soil temperature. In our instance, we're, we're using that more and more, especially in Carlsbad, the flower fields. Uh, we, we had a very negative experience this year because it got so warm with this El Nino, the nighttime temperatures never dropped down. And so we have part of our crop that flowers, we set it up, through processes to flower in October, November, December, which is off cycle. It got so warm, and then we had that 95 degree temperature on the coast, right on, on the coast in Carlsbad, that the plants, instead of going into flowering mode, they went into, into bulb produ production mode. Okay, so they thought they were going into summer instead of going into fall and winter. And we lost the entire crop, okay, because the soil temperature got too hot. That plant, since that hot, soil temperature, we weren't really dialed into that particular part of, of the planting as being, I don't know why we didn't think about it, but we didn't think about it. So now we've learned, and so we're going to be monitoring, at least in the, that summer, fall window, on that particular crop, what's the soil temperature, so that if we do have an elevated level, maybe we can put shade on or something like that. Can we bring them in? Uh, yeah, I think, any, any other burning questions? We can ask more as, as everybody else comes in. Right. Okay? Here we go. Very good. Okay. Um, and yeah, that's not wasn't meant to be like an adversarial. Oh no 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 no. For, uh, oh. for like guys in avocado groves. Oh. I do a lot of work. I develop wireless. I got a whistle. Can you whistle? <laughs> <laughs> so folks, we had a lot of really good questions came up that we deferred uh, we deferred to. I think Mike and I are going to kind of do a bit of a um, uh, a team a tag team here on on some questions. Um, I certainly had some questions that I would like to answer about different sensor technologies, gypsum blocks, different types of sensors. If I can answer them, I will. If not, I can try and find an answer for you and pass that through Jim, perhaps. Um, Mike, you, you mentioned you had questions about... Um, well, we, we, had the, we had the question, and, and I couldn't answer it, but how, how do the sensors actually work? What's the... What's the physics and, and, and such that allows these sensors, what are they sensing, how do they work, and how do they function, and why are they better than, than the gypsum blocks or yeah, the, yeah. Than, than the others? Um, should we start off with the, with the gypsum block uh, question? I can't remember who asked me that. Um, some, some, somebody. Anyway, a lot of people have used watermark sensors. Um, so if you're familiar with watermarks, that is a gypsum block. Now, how that 
works, sorry, I gotta keep the mic on me, I guess. Um, that works in that what it does is it absorbs water into, from the surrounding soil into that, into that gypsum block. And they've used them for years, and actually I think the technology is, is very, very solid, very sound. Um, they work on a kind of a matrix potential uh, similar to what we were talking about with the, with the aromatas similar type of, of sensor. So what they're doing is they are, uh, they're absorbing water from the surrounding profile and they are giving you a matrix potential reading. I'm not sure if, uh, if um, there were any particular questions about watermarks, but in my, in my limited experience with watermarks is um, the issue is two things. Number one, they don't typically well, work terribly well in sandier, lighter soils. So if you've got if you've got air in your profile, uh, there's a there's a literally a physics. You know, actually that water movement is a uh, air is a is a wonderful barrier to water movement. Um, so that's why we typically don't use them in nurseries in soilless substrates because there's just too much air in those substrates. Um, the other issue is is responsive uh, responsiveness. They tend to work in very well in soil systems that are slow moving, that um, basically there's a lot of time for, for the water dynamics to, to, to basically, um, uh, I guess, adjust. Um, so those are the two things that I know about watermark sensors. I'm, I'm not sure, maybe there's some actual people in the room who actually know more about it than I do. Mike, have you ever used yeah. watermarks? No, it was just, just no, not really. Okay. Great avocados. Great in avocados, yeah. yeah. I mean, they're rock solid, yep. bulletproof in avocado groups. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So, so that kind of technology is great. And I think where I start with any technology is start off with the sensor. Understand what the sensor will do for you because you've got to marry your sensor capability with your production situation. So if you're in a soil-based situation and you think watermarks are going to work for you, Great technology. They're, I think they're a pretty good price point on on the sensors. Have they got to a point where they've actually started linking up all of the sensors uh, from different fields through so, telemetry so, approaches? So, yeah, Kurt? I mean, so Arometer has a solution for that. Mm -hmm. But again, any type of radio technology. I, I mean, I built my own modules mm -hmm. to be able to pull that data up and send yep. it back to the internet. Yep. So I mean, it's just a great uh, mechanism. It's a great sensor for that. Yeah. But they all, a lot of the sensors work on the same potential of reading them electronically. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of how you get that data back. Get that data back to you. So, so that's, that's where I think it's really important to, to um, take a little time to do some research on different sensors. Um, Spectrum puts out a lot of sensors as well, similar to Decagon. I don't know if you ever, any of you have heard of the Hobo Spectrum data. They do, they do weather stations. They're in the same kind of market. Um, I don't have a whole lot of experience um, with uh, Spectrum technology. Um, I've just learned what uh, I have from Mark Van Yersel at the University of Georgia, who's done a lot of comparison. He's, done, he's compared Aclima, he's compared uh, Hobo Spectrum, he's compared Decagon. He's compared Campbell Scientific. So there's lots of different sensors out there. They're all at different price points. And all I can say and all I'm prepared to say is they're at different price points for a reason. If you buy a cheap sensor, you're probably going to get either a, a limited capability or more importantly, you're probably going to get pretty bad support. And if I've learned anything in the last three to five years, what's really important in this game is go with, go with whomever, if you feel comfortable with a company, and you can cold call these companies, and you can find your own level of comfort. But with that level of comfort, talk to the people in the company and say, ask them the hard questions. OK, yes, you sell, you sell a sensor at this price, but what's your warranty on that sensor? And if, if it goes out, what's, what's your policy on that? Um, if you are buying a sensor and a system, if that's coming in a box, what do they do to tell you how to literally install it and support you on that? Because part of this 
whole issue in terms of being able to use this technology, I really understand you guys in terms of the time limitations that it takes. And quite frankly, even I'm challenged by, by some of the just putting it together. So it's really important that somebody in that company can really be knowledgeable and help you through the installations. Or they have, go to their websites, look at what their resources they've got, look at how much, if they've got application notes, look at they've got how-to videos, look at their website and see what resources they're going to support you with. Because a lot of companies, will they're very quick to sell you a box of stuff. Very quick. But that's the easy part. Not the easy part for you guys, because you're having to fork out it out your wallet. But that support issue is really critical. Also, quite frankly, I think we have to be honest. I think the universities and, and the extension capabilities that we have countrywide are limited. Extension is, doing a, is being asked to do a whole lot less for a whole, a whole lot more for a whole lot less. And unfortunately, we don't have the capacity to support you guys. So unfortunately, it's coming back. They're, so companies should have some kind of, they should have some kind of, at least be thinking of some kind of networks of consultants who, yes, you might pay for it, but if you're paying for an installation, somebody is responsive and will do that installation, do it well, because honestly, your time is not well spent putting some sensors in the soil. Your time is better spent making the decisions based on those sensors. So I don't know if that's informative, but that's kind of where I am on this whole, this whole situation because it's exciting technology. It does come at a price, but support issues are, are really critical in you being able to, uh, to actually just get on. And, and you know, I, I, I think I understand the challenges that some of you face I, just from what Mike's told me, and and you know that's 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 a that's a that's a problem. That's a that's a huge problem that you guys have. So, yes, question. Is there any reason to have a sensor that would measure the amount of available oxygen in the root zone and soils? That's a really good question, and and um, I know Mark Vignesel has done some work. One of the other good sensor companies that I will recommend um, is Apogee. Uh, Apogee Instruments out of Logan, Utah. In fact, uh, most of the light sensors that Decagon and others, even Lycor, actually sell now, uh, not Lycor, um, Campbell Scientific Cell, are actually Apogee. Uh, his, his, the person who founded that company is Dr. Bruce Bugby. He's actually a physiologist at Utah State. Bruce is working with oxygen sensors, and it's interesting because I think what we're beginning to do, do some work is in bioremediation. So what I like about these sensors is like there's so many different applications. So in bioremediation, redox potential and oxygen potential is re and oxygen content uh, is really important, obviously, in being able to figure out what's going on. But for plant roots, I think we had a conversation. Most of most we talked about root root pancakes of roots and why roots don't really typically grow below 18 inches. Well, it's not really because there's not any water down there or there's not any nutrients. There's plenty of both. It's just that there's not that much oxygen. And so, roots really do need oxygen to proliferate, and that's why you you tend to get that pancake of roots in the top six, 12, sometimes 18 inches, depending on how good your soil is. Um, Question, yeah. Can you uh, expand on salinity sensors, their usefulness or not? And Mike says that he doesn't trust what he's testing lab, mm -hmm. uh, using the lab. EC sensors are hard. Uh, there's, so there's, there's a number of different EC sensors that you can buy. Um, most EC sensors are aqueous based. They do a great job. If you stick an aqueous, if you set, stick an EC sensor in a glass of water with some salt in it, Fantastic. No arguments. When you take a sensor and put it in a soil or a substrate, how they actually measure EC is they measure two things. They measure bulk, which is the, the, the electrical conductivity of the particle of the electrons and, and ions associated with that soil particle, and that's what's called bulk. And then what 
for example, that GS3 does, it, they use a, a model which is called the Hillhorst model. It's a, actually a pretty solid model for soils to extrapolate that data to what they call pore water EC. Now, pore water EC, EC is the is this EC of the moisture between soil particles. So that's what the water in between particles. For me, I'm very interested in pore water EC, uh, not so interested in bulk, because uh, pore water EC is what your roots are extracting. OK. There is a better model out there called the Rhodes model, which we've done some work on for measuring for predicting pore water EC. Unfortunately, it's so complicated, it's really hard for us to implement it in, in practice. It's great in theory, not so good in practice. Um, so we, we actually, the GS3, um, Mike probably showed you some of the pore water EC data that we're getting. Um, I've tested uh, GS3s in a number of environments. They have a, um, certainly Decagon has another EC sensor called an ES2. That one is designed to actually screw into a pipe, and that will actually measure the electrical conductivity of your water and your. So that one you can take to the bank. That one you absolutely can take to the bank. The pore water EC, the GS3 in the root zone, a little bit more tenuous. But what I can tell you I've done is I've measured salts in, salts with the GS3 in the root zone, and salts out, and got fairly good correlations with them, at least they're in the same ballpark. Um, so I'm beginning to trust GS3 data a whole lot more than I used to. Um, but it does take, I think, a little bit of time and effort in correlating what you're getting from the lab with the soil, moist, with the soil analysis with those readings and for you to start really trusting the data. Trusting data is really important in this, because if you don't trust the data, don't mess with it. Yeah. And salinity. Salinity being so important for you guys is really important, I think, for us to do a much better job. You know, you know I don't know who's working on salinity in, in California, but I think it's being able to provide this data from a research perspective and then inform, develop the tools better is, is probably a priority, certainly for us. Yes? A uh, recommendation I see a lot uh, is to, uh, to amend your water. And uh, you know, many of the labs will recommend uh, using uh, sulfuric acid or enteric or any number of different things to get your irrigation water down to six or five five or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. um, have you seen a benefit? That's with pH. That? Yes, pH five, yes. five. Have six, you seen six. a benefit of uh, of that over uh, you know in your neck of the woods? And do you think it's a benefit that uh, is worth uh, implementing out here if indeed you? have water that's either recycled or, you know, our water now is coming mostly from the Colorado River and uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, all, all the, all the elements are going yep. up and up and up, the, yep. the yep. less desirable elements. Yeah. Well, um, I'm not sure, quite honestly, that, a, that acidification, I'm not, I'm, I'm not a water chemist, I have to tell you, so I'm, take, take what I tell you with a grain of salt. <laughs> Sorry, bad one. There we go. Grain of potassium, <laughs> potassium nitrate. <laughs> Better. <laughs> no sodium chloride in them. Um, so I think what, where I've used acidification is my, mainly in, in greenhouse systems, and it's usually when you've got high carbonates and bicarbonates, alkalinity. So I'm not sure if you have high alkalinity in your groundwater. Usually, I would only acid inject uh, if I've got high alkalinity, because I'm not sure what acidification will do to flocculate anything else out. It may just, I'm, I'm not sure where that recommendation comes from, personally. I don't, I don't have a basis for that. Alkalinity, certainly. So if you've got an alkalinity above maybe 150, 140, 150 million equivalents, um, that's at the point where you start getting a lot of buildup of calcium, and particularly bicarbonates. Plants do not do very well with bicarbonates. Carbonates and bicarbonates. Carbonates they're typically okay with. Bicarbonates they really don't like. So, again, I would get your water analyzed by a reputable lab. Find out what your alkalinity is. Talk to your local extension person about your water quality. Uh, if you go in with a well water analysis, hopefully somebody can actually interpret that. If if the lab doesn't do that, they 
hopefully should do a pretty good job at interpreting, interpreting the data that you have. Um, but um, yeah, um, I think typically what I, and I'm, I'm, as I say, I'm, I'm learning, I don't know much about the water quality that you guys are actually dealing with in terms of actual salt load. Does, can anybody kind of tell me what's, what the typical sodium chloride sulfur is? Dustin? And what's the breakdown on sodium and chloride and 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 a lot of hardness? A lot of hardness. Okay, so you do have uh, do you have alkalinity? Okay. Yeah, I know you. I know some people closer to the coast are probably dealing with some ground groundwater intrusion as well, saltwater intrusion into wells. I don't know if that's an issue. It's certainly been an issue for us. Funnily enough, in Maryland, uh, in some of the low areas on the shore where we've had uh, saltwater intrusion just because of over-exploitation of aquifers. Um, so, um, yeah, water quality issues can really sneak up, t up, up on, in a hurry on you. So, um, I think there was a question about how sen the sensors actually worked. Um, I did explain this a little bit, but um, I don't know if that's... Does, Great, great question. So there's, there's a couple of options. What's the question? Oh, sorry. Repeat the question. Um, what is the monthly cost of, soft, of the software? Now, what, um, I'm not sure, Mike, you didn't show them the Decagon portal, did you? Right, I did. Uh, so Decagon, a lot of the, and I'm just talking about Decagon because I'm familiar with the product, is that their EM50 G nodes, the cell nodes, will transmit to the to the cell phone. Thanks, Jess. Can you pull it up? Um, and they will provide a kind of a, a, a portal where that data will come in. Um, that is free associated with the node. There's no cost to that. Um, um, Jess is just going to pull it up here. This, the, the internet's a little. Those electrons are churning along. Anyway, we'll get there. Uh, um, the. Um, so that's free, but it's basically just a reader. So it, it'll pull the data in. You can email the data to yourself, but it doesn't do anything for you. So the software provider that I'm using, and there's a couple of reasons what, that we're doing this. Decacon actually has another software package called DataTrack, which will cost you about $400 for just a site license. So you don't have to, that's it. That's the cost on that. Um, David Kernbash, who did the MyEM software that we've showed you um, for the EM50G subscription, he's charging, I think, in the region of $100 a month uh, for that software. Sounds like a lot, but what I think the capabilities within that software is because if you're certainly if you're looking at control, uh, there's no other software that will do it for you. So that's the only software that will do control at this point that I'm familiar with. Um, how we're using it with Mike. Um, Mike, I think I'd like you to answer what you think is, what, what are the advantages for SensorWeb? Because I think you took that decision. And, and what, do you, what does SensorWeb do for you that, that, that um, the Echoes, the Decagon stuff didn't? Um, I think I commented a couple of times on this. The Decagon uh, software platform that they have right now doesn't give us a lot of a lot of ability to manipulate, look at the data in different ways. It's very basic. Um, the sensor web platform has lots of flexibility, uh, ability to fine tune the reports to what we want to look at. Uh, ultimately, you know, looking at the ability to control the valves, uh, I think, is going to be a, a key part of it. And so. From my point of view, I was looking at the evolution of the software and where it was going, and I think Mayhem, the, the sensor web, is going to give us a lot more as a company uh, as we progress in, in our understanding and usability of this. Now, I understand that the Decagon is developing some similar software capabilities to sensor web. I haven't seen it. I don't know how well it works, so uh, 
you know, what's the here and now is what I can go with, not what is the promised and, and un, unseen. It could prove out that what Decagon is putting together, I think it's called Plant Point, uh, will function effectively and maybe maybe is an option to consider going forward. But until I've seen it, touched it, feel it, uh, looked at what his capabilities are, I, I can't really say that um, that's the way to go. Now for a ground -based Okay, Decagon is based in Portland, Washington. They are a company that was actually founded by, uh, I'm you, sorry to not tell you this before, but basically uh, Decagon was founded by a uh, biophysicist, soil biophysicist by the name of Galen Campbell, taught at Pullman, Washington State. Um, he founded this company about 20, 25 years ago. Their guiding principle is they wanted to provide farmers with tools uh, that basically could, they could have almost like research grade tools that are an affordable price. I, I tried price. to, I couldn't get on, I think their website's down. Yeah, I don't know what to say. We'll, we'll get that. Thanks, Jim. Um, Mayim is uh, basically a spin out of the our project, David Cohenbash is the uh, the software engineer uh, of that, and he's the president of that company. He's based in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, my relationship with Decagon and uh, David is, I'm a distributor of uh, Decagon products in the north. I work with David primarily on software because personally, in the nursery and greenhouse arena, uh, the Decagon software, to be to be totally honest, just doesn't cut it for me. That was the whole reason for our project, is we didn't have the tools for me to be able to uh, really provide what we needed for the nursery and greenhouse industry. Um, what I like about David is that he will actually, he writes his own code, and so if you go to him with a problem, he will actually fix that problem for you. He will actually develop that. So that's part of his service. Who makes the node? Node is made all by deck. All the nodes and sensors are all made by Decagon. They, they actually um, have their own factory in Pullman, Washington. It's a, a very interesting place to visit. They are a sister company of Campbell Scientific. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Campbell Scientific. If I was going to put a weather station in the Antarctic, there's only one company in the world that I would go to, and that's Campbell Scientific. Simple as that. Because I know uh, 10 years later, a weather station sitting out there in the Antarctic is still working. Simple as that. There's, no, there's nothing that will beat them. Uh, the problem with Campbell is you need a PhD to program it. <laughs> <laughs> That's the problem. That's the difference between Campbell and Decagon, because Decagon has developed the nodes that provide that kind of capability, but now we can use within a farming environment. We can take the pain out of all of that. But I'm not going to say that they're directly plug and play at this point. I'm not going to say that there's not a bit of a learning curve, but believe me, the data that I think that you've probably seen today and the capabilities are light years <coughs> of where I started even in, in the two, year 2000. And, and I think maybe from Charlie's point of view, maybe the question also is how do, if people are interested in getting more information, going the next step, Starting to implement some of this stuff. How? What's the conduit? How do they? Yeah. Do they work with you? Do they work with Decagon? Do they work with Mam? How do we connect the pieces so that they can sure. ultimately deploy? Well, I think if you're interested, um, I, I, at this point, um, Decagon has a network of consultants. They have a lot of consultants in California, um, so I'm part of that consultant network as well. Although I have an independent company. But I think what Mike has learned is that a lot of Decagon's consultants 
are not necess don't have the necessary knowledge that we need in the specialty crop arena. I think it's really important that you, you work with somebody who has an ability to translate not only what's going on in the soil, but more importantly, translate that into what your crop is doing and work with you on that because you know, there's a mentality here as well. A lot of consultants will come in, come in and I ask you, tell you to do a whole lot of stuff and expect you to do it and then pay them a whole lot of money. Um, but the question is, well, is that information really trustworthy? So for me, I think finding a consultant that really works well, and I think this is a, a gap that we've identified in this particular area, is that there's not really a whole lot of consultants that will actually do this. Um, I must admit, I was a, I was a little, uh, I wouldn't say scared. Jim, when you sent me that email and said, tell me how many people were interested in this, but, but it made me think about how we need to gear up our support services and do that intelligently. And I'm not gonna tell you that we have the answers. Um, I think Mike and I are certainly talking about it, and I'd like to certainly maybe talk to Jim about it, but I think there's a, there's, a, there's a real need for some people to be able to not only support you guys on installations, but also be able to answer your questions in terms of you know, exactly what we've been doing here today. I think it's very important. Thank you for your insight into the watermark, because I think that's very valuable for a lot of growers. I think the question is that I'd like to know, and I don't know, is that whether Watermark actually has, has closed the gap between the sensors in the ground and, and what you can get e quickly and easily on your cell phone or whether you can see that. That's very often the gap that we've identified. That was a re real issue. The real reason that our project focused so heavily on that is we know we needed to close the gap. Because otherwise you spend your life, you know, you may love to do that nights and weekends, but yeah. most of us don't. So, <laughs> so should, if, if they want, do they contact you then, in the, at least initially, on I think, this? Yeah, I'm, I'm very happy to be a, a point person. Whether I would be the person to, that would, that would you know, end up working with you guys or not, I, you know, that's, that's something I think that needs to be worked out. But um, also there's other companies. I, I would really encourage you if you're very interested in this technology, I'll certainly put you in touch with some companies that I know, some other people. I think it's very important for you to do due diligence, and, and if you think that it's going to help you, be comfortable with the company that you choose. And think about what they're providing, how they're going to provide it, how they're going to support it, more importantly, because your time is valuable. And certainly, I think, Obviously, your crops are valuable. We're in a crisis now. There's an awful lot of people out there, I think, who are probably, I don't know, um, selling some stuff. So, Jim, do we have everybody's email address? We do. Okay, so, so perhaps as a, as a follow-up to this meeting, we can put together the kind of stuff that Charlie's asking, sure. you know, where, where to go, who to contact, potential candidates to, to help them take it from this conceptual stage into uh, implementation if, if, if they're interested. Okay, so we'll and we were talking about doing a post survey, so we'd love to know your feelings after this program, whether you're going to implement it and whether you haven't implemented it. So we may send another survey out like the one you filled out to register for this. I wanted to, uh, and I hate to do this, but I wanted to stop now because otherwise the food is... Yeah sitting there too long, but I don't want John to eat a thing, which means you got to keep asking him questions. Yeah. So, so one uh, thing I just wanted to add on to Jim, please, as part of that survey, if, if you have a comment box, what would be most valuable for us to learn is what you think, where you think the gaps are and what needs to be addressed. It's really important for us to know that. I'm part, just to let you know, I'm part of a new SEOI that's going forward. Uh, if well, actually, that the whole part, part of the big part of this SCI that moving forward is we, we know where we've got to support people better, but we don't know how to do that. So if you have any, if you have any insight into how you think that should be structured for yourselves, I would love to hear from, from you.
That's a grant. It's a big grant. I don't know if well, you're familiar with that. But it, it, looking for dollars. Anybody that's that interested, Decagon provided all the, the materials here for the display today, and they sent their little thing here. If you want more information on Decagon, you have some we have. Yes, we have yes, I think they said 60, so they should be hooked with them. So we'll send. So uh, let's go ahead and let's open it up and eat, but you're welcome to come right back in here and keep, keep the engagement going on and keep continue to ask questions uh, and stay.